Hey, so hi, my name is Sebastian Budgen. I'm a founding member of Historical Materialism Journal and the book series and the conferences, some of which you will already be familiar with. So I want to just to pitch to you the idea of you uh, subscribing to the journal, firstly. The journal comes out four times a year, published by Brill, over a thousand pages of uh, extremely important and stimulating uh, Marxist theory and Marxist history. Um, we have a discount at the moment for individual subscribers around the time of the, the London conference, and we very strongly uh, both request and uh, demand that you subscribe to the journal, that you uh, get other people to subscribe to the journal, and of course that you get uh, your institution, if you're part of a university or other institution, to subscribe to the journal. We need more subscribers for this project to be able to expand and continue. The second thing I really wanted to push was the book series. Uh, the book series you will also probably be familiar with. It's published by Brill Academic Press, and then the volumes come out 12 months later. The Haymarket Books in Chicago, paperback. Um, we have more than 200 volumes published now of translations of original work, of document collections, of uh, translations from uh, Marxist theory from across the world, from Japan to uh, uh, China to um, India to Latin America, very important Latin American list shaping up in the book series and so on. Um, it's a really crucial intervention in Marxist uh, literature and uh, in making Marxist theory available um, that really hasn't existed on the scale since the 1970s. So we'd like you to look at the book series, buy individual volumes, perhaps take up the offer of the book club that Haymarket is, uh, is, is uh, promoting. And also, of course, if, you get, if you're part of an institution, to get your institution to buy as many volumes as possible. Uh, those are the two key elements of our activity, aside from the conference, the journal and the book series. And we think it would be uh, well, we, it's essential, basically, for us, for our existence, for us to be able to continue to thrive or close to expand. So please, subscribe to the journal, buy the books in the book series, publicize both around you, and help us build historical materials and project. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob Knox, a member of the HM Editorial Board, and I will be chairing this session in the HM Online Conference, and this session is Studies in Critical Theory. Um, unfortunately, Jacob Blumenfeld, one of the participants, couldn't make it today, but we've still got three excellent speakers. And speaking in this order will be, firstly, Philippa Minozzi, who's a lecturer at Liverpool John Moores University, and he's the author of the book World Literature, Non-Synchronism and the Politics of Time, the link of which you will find in the YouTube comments. He'll then be followed by Artur Bueno, who is a lecturer at the University of Frankfurt in philosophy and is the co-editor of this recent volume, uh, Critical Theory and New Materialism. And then finally, uh, Murillo van der Laan at the University of Camp Campinas, who is a postdoc and did his PhD in the theory of value in Lukács, and Lukács' ontology will be speaking. So everyone's gonna get about 20 minutes to speak and then we'll open the floor up to questions. So, um, Filippo, if you want to kick us off, that'd be great. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for introducing me and uh, also to those of you uh, for being here. So I'm now going to uh, share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Is that visible? Yes, thank you. So, um, okay, no, so I'm going to start. Um, so uh, today, my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, reading uh, Lukács in an era of global pandemic. And I wanted to start uh, with a personal anecdote, um, which is the fact that since the start of the pandemic, I found myself reading and rereading uh, many works by Lukács, uh, increasingly and populating my you know, library shelves with these books. Uh, so at some point I started to question whether uh, Lukács uh, might have something to say uh, or like could actually speak as a thinker from the past to our 21st century era. And I asked, I started to ask myself in which ways uh, Lukács might be uh, a, you know, a timely thinker uh, in this very difficult and strange historical conjuncture. And um, the second point I wanted to make, uh, starting from this uh, personal anecdote, um, is the fact that um, Lukács is an incredibly complex thinker who went through various phases and also 
uh, who rethought and um, sometimes even rejected aspects of his previous uh, works uh, later in his life. And so uh, when we talk about the thinker you know, of this caliber, obviously the question is, uh, which Lukács <laughs> did you find so timely and interesting today? And the, if you want controversial uh, point, I wanted to uh, use a starting point of my reflections today is that alongside uh, Lukács as the author of, you know, wonderful books like History and Class Consciousness and, you know, founding figure of Western Marxism and critical theory, uh, I must confess uh, that I'm finding increasingly interesting and productive uh, a more controversial Lukács. Um, that will be the Lukács uh, of author of essays from the late 20s and early 30s. And um, this phase in Lukács' life, uh, life politics and uh, oeuvre um, is uh, very different from his previous and later <laughs> phases and uh, has also been subject to intense controversy and uh, debate. So I wanted to start um, by reconsidering uh, Lukács in this particular historical moment uh, from the 20s, uh, late 20s, early 30s of the past century, because as I'm going to try to explain today, is there that I found some elements that will probably and possibly speak to our uh, troubled times in the 21st century. And I wanted to start by um, uh, mentioning here um, uh, an essay which is probably uh, the most controversial of all, uh, which is the essay um, uh, included in uh, Lukács' books on Goethe on uh, Holderlin's Hyperion. And uh, this essay was written in 1934-35. Uh, um, and uh, I wanted to start, uh, so to speak, in medias res uh, with this uh, controversial text because uh, in this essay, Lukács is dealing with a very cogent, very important problem, uh, which is uh, the fact of living in non-revolutionary times and how can the left, you know, or actually intellectuals in general, uh, position themselves in historical moments that are uh, not utopian or revolutionary or progressive in any, in any way. So so, um, and in this uh, essay, indeed, he uh, famously uh, drew this comparison, this contrast, actually, between, on the one hand, Hegel, and on the other, Hölderlin. Um, uh, both Hegel and Hölderlin, earlier in their life, uh, had been enthusiastic uh, for the French Revolution. Uh, the legend goes that they planted the tree of freedom and danced around it when, you know, in their early, uh, you know, young age. But uh, later on, as the post-revolutionary, reactionary, Thermidorian moment uh, ensued, they had uh, very different responses to a changing state of affairs. And in this, Lukács famously uh, made this contrast and built his argument around this contrast between Hegel and Herderlin. As he wrote uh, in one of the most illuminating and also quite controversial passages of this essay, and I quote here from Lukács, uh, Hegel comes to terms with the post-Termidorian epoch and the close of the revolutionary period of bourgeois development. And he builds up his philosophy precisely on an understanding of this new turning point in world history. Hölderlin makes no compromise with the post-Thermidorian reality. He remains faithful to the old revolutionary ideal and is broken by a reality which had no place for his ideals, not even on the level of poetry and thought. Now, there are many, <laughs> many questions, uh, of course, at work uh, in this passage. And I wanted to mention at least two very important points uh, that are worth of you know, commentary and further reflection here. The first one is that uh, this essay is on Hegel and Hölderlin, and this contrast is between basically Hegel as someone who was able to come to term with a non-revolutionary reality and reconstruct his own philosophy system of thinking out of the actual historical circumstances and the changed historical circumstances, so called adapt to, uh, to his times. Uh, in contrast to Holderlin, who, in his faithfulness to the event, uh, was actually broken by reality and basically remained trapped in this uh, romantic utopianism and was unable to really grasp and uh, kind of respond to what was going on. Now, the two points I wanted to make, obviously, here are firstly that Lukács is here uh, using this kind of detour, this historical analogy, really to talk about himself, as uh, he had to face in that particular conjunction a 
a very complicated uh, dilemma, an inner predicament between, on the one hand, being faithful to his uh, utopian ideals of young age and his previous involvement in politics, especially after the October Revolution, and the changing reality of uh, the uh, onset of the Stalinist uh, regime at the time. So uh, this contrast between Hegel and Hölderlin is really about Lukács himself, is an inner dilemma. And uh, the other important point, uh, obviously, to note, uh, from this uh, really interesting passage is this reference to Termido, because uh, obviously this is an historical reference to uh, Hegel and Holderlin, but uh, this essay was written uh, not long after Trotsky had famously described uh, Stalinism as the Termidor of the October Revolution. And so this essay has been taken as Lukács' response to Trotsky in saying basically that the position following this kind of Hegelian model we should take in this situation is to come to terms with the new reality and uh, hence, uh, uh, you know, this kind of contrast was kind of uh, apparently solved by Lukacs in this way. And this essay um, has been subject for this reason uh, to an intense uh, debate and, and, and criticism. And um, uh, one of the most important texts uh, dealing with this uh, is a wonderful, wonderful book by Michael Levy, um, translated in English as uh, Lukács from Romanticism to Bolshevism. So it's a study of uh, Lukács' early work, um, which includes a very important chapter on Lukács and, and Stalinism. Um, is a book in which we find a really interesting, really illuminating analysis of this shift, this turning point uh, in Lukács' life from an earlier utopian phase to uh, the real politic of Stalinism. So as uh, Levy writes, uh, after a utopian revolutionary stage lasting from 1919 to 1921, from 1926, Lukács drew nearer to realism, pure and simple, and as a consequence, politically closer to the non-revolutionary realpolitik of Stalin. His Moses Hess of 1926 had far-reaching political implications. It provided the methodological basis for his support for the Soviet Thermidor. This hidden implicit meaning of the philosophical writings of 1926, overlooked by most commentators, was further confirmed by an essay written in 1935, Holderlin's Hyperion, in which Lukács dealt explicitly with Hegel's attitude to Thermidor itself. Now, I wanted to, uh, again, make a few points about uh, this really uh, important and illuminating passage. Uh, now, Levy is providing us with a very useful narrative that explains so many things about uh, Lukács' later work. In particular, I mean, if you think about this, Lukács' later interest in realism, in literary realism, uh, can also be located in this kind of uh, turning point in which Lukács moved away from his utopian ideals and uh, kind of uh, reconciled himself with the new Stalinist reality and can also explain uh, subsequent phases in Lucas' life uh, is also his turn to aesthetics and uh, you know works that he produced in the 30s and 30s uh, or book like for example the destruction of reason very controversial you know rewritings of um, German philosophy. Um, now, um, there is also, I mean, there are other aspects that I wanted to uh, emphasize here. Um, Levy is taking these two essays, the first uh, essay I mentioned in my presentation on Holderlin, and also another previous essay on Moses Hess as symptomatic of this turn and this shift um, uh, in Lukács' lives and uh, the kind of symptom of this reconciliation with Stalinism. Now, uh, this word, the reconciliation in this problem, uh, in my view, is very important because because it's also how Theodore Adorno famously uh, described uh, Adorno in a damning essay uh, in which he kind of attacked Lucas' uh, response to you know, modernism and literary modernism in particular. Uh, however, um, it, this is also interesting because uh, more recently, other commentators and critics have provided a very different, actually uh, opposed uh, view of this uh, particular and controversial moment in uh, Lukács' life and work. And in particular, I'm referring here to Slavoj Žižek, who uh, kind of went back to this uh, difficult moment in Lukács' life and uh, gave a completely different interpretation of the significance of Lukács' transition from an early utopian to a later real politic phase in his life. And in particular, in an essay included in Revolution at the Gates, so Zizek's um, 
uh, selection of writings uh, from Lenin, but this is also a position that uh, Zizek develops in an essay uh, included as an appendix to the English translation of Thalism and, di and the dialectic, uh, Lukács' defense of historian class consciousness, in which Zizek is um, basically reversing <laughs> this narrative of a turn from utopia to real politic and a reconciliation with reality as this kind of, uh, you know, kind of giving up <laughs> basically of utopia. Uh, as uh, Zizek writes in a passage of this, uh, again, very controversial and provocative analysis, true heroism lies in abandoning the position of the beautiful soul and fully accepting the present as the only possible domain of actual freedom. Lukács' text should therefore be read as an answer to Trotsky. He accepts Trotsky's characterization of Stalin's regime as Thermidorian, giving it a positive twist. Instead of bemoaning the loss, uh, the loss of utopian energy, we should, in a heroically resigned way, accept its consequence as the only actual space of social progress. And as you can see, uh, this is a, a typical, I mean, a Gijek, uh, theme in Gijek's work, um, you know, what he called in another book, The Courage of Hopelessness. So this idea basically that in order to achieve social transformation, we should accept the present, start from the present and abandon any uh, utopian or ideal of a you know, future society that might be uh, unachievable. And as you can see here, um, uh, there are many controversial uh, parts uh, in this uh, extra and this, in this rereading of Lukács, in particular, uh, this idea of um, uh, rereading the Thermidorian aspect of uh, Stalinism uh, in, a, in a positive way, or actually, uh, possibly in a non-Thermidorian way uh, at all. And um, interestingly, uh, Michael Levy uh, recently responded to Zizek uh, not long ago, actually, in an essay published uh, last year, um, um, you know, online essay in which uh, uh, Levy is kind of questioning uh, some of the assumptions and the conclusion of Zizek's rereading of Lukács, and in particular, this uh, provocative statement um, that Zizek makes about the greatness of Stalinism. <laughs> and so this idea basically that um, the definition of Stalinism as Thermidorian could be a bit mistaken, uh, because uh, obviously the is seeing this in two, like a process, an historical process, and something like that should be rescued and reinterpreted, which is obviously a kind of a, a provocative point, controversial point. And uh, Levy responded uh, about like this supposed greatness of, greatness of Stalinism by uh, remarking actually the negative side of uh, uh, you know, Stalinism and of Lukács' turn in the 30s. Um, now, um, I wanted to make a few points here because uh, obviously the question of uh, considering uh, Stalinism as Thermidorian, so the original historical analogy, which was proposed by Trotsky originally, um, is a problematic thing in itself and can be subject to further debate and scrutiny. And obviously the question might also be posed about today, our times, if this Thermidorian analogy could be useful to describe the 21st century or not. However, I also wanted to point out that the other part of this problem uh, seems to be a bit overlooked in this emphasis on the value or significance of this historical analogy, which is the question of reconciliation. Because uh, both Zizek and Levy, um, in many ways, uh, keep this idea of uh, reconciliation as uh, coming to terms, as accepting the new reality, accepting the present as something which is at the core of uh, Lukács' turn in the 30s from an earlier to a later phase. However, the point I wanted to make or some suggestions I would like to propose today is that uh, in fact, the idea of reconciliation uh, might be a bit more complicated, especially if we go back uh, to uh, the, the essays, the two uh, essays at stake here, uh, the 26 uh, essay on Moses S and the later essay on uh, Hölderlin and Hegel. And in this essay, we can see, especially uh, the first essay on Moses S, uh, we can see how actually um, Lukács was trying to reinterpret uh, a quintessentially Hegelian term, the idea, this idea of reconciliation uh, in a completely different and still in my view kind of uh, very productive and unthought way. Um, in particular, uh, as a question of being able to reimagine the possibility of utopia in, non, in a non-utopian and non-revolutionary age. 
As we can read from, a, in my view, a very important passage of his essay on Moses Hess, refusal to go any further reveals Hegel's magnificent realism, his rejection of all utopias, his concern to conceive philosophy as the conceptual expression of history itself, and not as philosophy about history. Hegel has often, and to some extent justifiably, been attacked for this tendency, this reconciliation with reality. But it must be remembered that he did arrive, that he derives methodologically from this urge to develop the categories out of the historical process itself. So one thing that we can see here is how Hegel, through this idea of reconciliation, is actually trying to construct, according to Lukács, a system of thought, a philosophy, out of the raw materials of history itself, rather than projecting it on history, rather than writing a philosophy about history. And in this, uh, I think uh, Lukács is really uh, offering a very provocative and uh, really fascinating uh, interpretation and a positioning of Hegel as a precursor of historical materialism and someone who actually posed the seeds for a materialist understanding of history and also a materialist understanding of intellectual labor. So this idea of reconciliation uh, in, like, in principle as a first point here uh, needs to be conceived as uh, this kind of reconciliation of thought and reality. Uh, this idea that thinking or intellectual work should be grounded in the actual historical circumstances out of which emerges. However, this idea of reconciliation is even more productive and fascinating. And I wanted here to make um, a quick detour as I approach the conclusion of my paper uh, by mentioning that in Hegel himself, uh, the idea of reconciliation is uh, much more productive and more nuanced and interesting and complicated uh, than a simple idea of resigning to reality or simply accepting uh, reality as it is, a kind of fatalism, basically. As Michael Hardiman writes in probably the most extensive study of the, the concept of reconciliation in Hegel, um, the main the difference between English and German words is that in its ordinary use, the English reconciliation can mean submission or resignation. But in fact, the features of reconciliation that give this impression are not shared by Herr Sonung, which contains a very strong element of affirmation. Also, in contrast to reconciliation, it strongly connotes a process of transformation. So as we can see, the German term used by uh, Hegel, Lukács, and Adorno, too, is the same word, is actually uh, more complex, uh, it cannot be simply translated as a resignation, as the acceptance of uh, history and the present as the ultimate horizon of history. And indeed, this is how Lukács kind of also was able to reconsider Hegel and the problems with Hegel's uh, own transformations, you know, in the Thermidorian age, as he continued in, from the same paragraph I read before, only in consequence of his reactionary hypostatizing of the present did it change from a dynamic principle impelling reality forwards into a static one designed to fix the stage presently, presently attained as an absolute. And indeed, the whole essay on Moses Hess uh, is uh, constructed around this critique of Hegel as a thinker who had uh, kind of unleashed uh, real critical potentials in uh, this idea of a philosophy able to grasp history as a process of becoming rather than being, but then in his politics had in fact turned into a hypostatizing of this into a kind of another being, another thing, a static thing, and actually having turned the present into an absolute. So as we can see, actually, the idea of reconciliation in Lukács is much more complicated. And indeed, uh, even in his later, uh, more <laughs> controversial essay on uh, Hölderlin's Hyperion, uh, we can see probably how uh, Lukács is not so much praising Hegel for his reactionary politics, for having simply accepted the present, but there is another reason much more interesting and significant for recuperating these aspects of Hegelian philosophy. As Lukács uh, writes, the world historical significance of Hegel's accommodation consists precisely in the fact that he grasped, as only Balzac beside him, the revolutionary development of the bourgeoisie as a unitary process, one in which the revolutionary terror, as well as Thermidor and Napoleon, were only necessary phases. As you can see, this is like the starting 
point for a historical materialist concept of, of history itself. And in particular, this idea of history as a unitary process, as a totality, which encompasses not only the past and the present or the present as the only reality we have, but actually, and most urgently, the dimension of the future as well as part of this historical process of which we are part and which we can constantly change. Thank you so much for listening. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Filippo. <clears throat> okay, so next it is our turn. So if you just want to go, that will be great. Sorry, I needed to unmute first. Okay. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you all for all the viewers, all the presenters. Um, okay, so I'll just start. Um, okay, so whoever, whoever intends to return to Lukacs' notion of the standpoint of the proletariat today shall face uh, significant challenges. Owing to Lukács' uh, reliance on an idealist philosophy of history and a romantic conception of society as a totality, so his critics have argued, the idea that the proletariat could become the identical subject object of history turned out to be not only theoretically equivocal, but also practically ineffective or even dangerous. Many of the recent, recent approaches to reification attempt to avoid these problems by abandoning altogether the assumption that the proletariat could play such a role in history. They seek to provide new definitions of reified and non-reified life without holding that a specific social class could be the bearer of a radical transformation of society leading from one state to the other. As a consequence, two issues that for Lukács were inextricably linked the diagnosis of reification on the one hand and the prospect of a revolution carried out by the working class on the other appear no longer amenable to a unified approach. The disjunction between these issues may have helped to circumvent part of the problems attributed to Lukács' analysis, yet it has also contributed to the obfuscation of a central question. Namely, how can collective struggles against reification emerge on the basis of the very contradictions of the capitalist order? While it was still possible for the author of history and class consciousness to rely on the proletariat in order to answer this question, that did not seem, did not seem to be the case for the ensuing generations of critical theorists. However, without a reference to the potential grave diggers of capitalist reification, its critique cannot but assume fatalistic or resigned tones or else find its foundation in ideals or ontologies detached from current social processes. The critique of reification thus finds itself today in a paradoxical situation, in as much as it tends to build a gap between reified and non-reified forms of life. Uh, Yatus, yet irrationalis, uh, uh, to use Lukács' words, between theory and practice that Lukács was precisely trying to overcome. So in this paper, I claim that a reinterpretation of Lukács' arguments concerning the transition from reified to revolutionary consciousness provides crucial elements to move beyond that paradox. The diagnosis of reification might then become relevant once again without falling prey to either an idealist subject object identity or a bourgeois antinomy between theory and practice. So the essay on reification famously begins with the assertion that the structure of commodity relations constitutes the prototype of all forms of objectivity and corresponding forms of subjectivity in capitalist society. However, this does not mean that such a diagnosis refers to the dystopian view of a totally commodified world, as Nancy Fraser, for instance, has argued. Reification is not a process through which everything becomes a commodity, but rather one by means of which the form of the commodity extends everywhere. While each sphere of capitalist society has an inner logic of its own, they are nevertheless homologous insofar as they possess the flesh form displayed most prominently in the commodity. And I quote Lukács' famous definition, the essence of the commodity structure is that a relation between people takes on the character of a thingness and thus acquires a phantom objectivity, which in its strict, apparently fully closed and rational inner logic, 
conceals every trace of its fundamental essence, the relation between people. So as this definition emphasizes, the fetish form has an enigmatic character. Its essence is to conceal its fundamental essence. Now, I would like to claim that this enigma has two sides. Um, so it points first to the fact that capitalist fetishism makes, a, makes the world as a whole lose its concrete qualitative organic aspect and take on an abstract quantitative mechanical character. Reification consists in an abstraction process by means of which reality appears governed by a system of autonomous laws which conceals and thus fails to grasp the concrete materiality of the world. It is in this sense that the world comes to be structured in a manner homologous to the commodity, whose abstract exchange value overrides its concrete use value. Like the commodity, all the other manifestations of capitalist society tend to present themselves in such a way that an abstract appearance conceals a concrete essence. However, the source of capitalist society's uh, phantom objectivity does not lie only there. Stopping at this point would lead us to a substantialist understanding of reification that would ground its critique on the remembering of a forgotten ontological reality. And I believe this is uh, how Honneth interprets uh, Lukács' concept of reification. But there's more to Lukács' critique than the concealment of a genuine concrete essence by a false abstract appearance. For the commodity form also establishes the very conditions for such a concealment namely the splitting of everything into an abstract and a concrete part, a mechanical rational form and an organic irrational matter. Capitalist society in, is to, torn apart or dilacerated, zerrissen, insofar as its vital manifestations appear split into two dimensions between which lies an unbridgeable gap. Um, this dilaceration takes on different guises according to the sphere, uh, sphere to which it applied applies. It is manifested in the commodities division into exchange value and use value, as well as in the juridical contrast between the formality of the law and the materiality of its objects, the political conflict between bureaucracy and charisma, and so on and so forth. Yet it is typical of capitalist fetishism that these rifts do not appear as historical outcomes of the universalization of the commodity form, but as natural realities governed by immutable laws. Hence, the fetish form not only promotes the concealment of a concrete matter by an abstract form, as I showed before, it also conceals itself as a historical process which makes the world appear inexorably, ontologically dilacerated into mechanical rational forms and organic irrational matters. So reification is thus constituted by a double concealment or a double naturalization. And yet, this does not result in a world without frictions or struggles. Uh, as Lukács points out, uh, reification is an intrinsically contradictory process, marked by a thrust to reduce the world to the principle of formal rationality. Fetish forms fi find ever new limits as they face manifold material elements, which resist in each and its own way to the complete uh, ful fulfillment of that process. This tension, this contradiction, reaches its peak in periods of crisis, in which these contradictions intensified intensified to the point of emerging in the form of an impasse. The limits to reification then present themselves not simply as occasional material resistance, but in, but in the more radical form of an irrational catastrophe in which the qualitative being of the things as incomprehensible and neglected thing in themselves as use values suddenly becomes the decisive factor. The crisis puts the system in check, disrupts the regular functioning of its laws, brings to light its contradictions and asks for a decision. This is why the issue of consciousness is so central to history and class consciousness. It points on the one hand to the problem of how, despite its contradictions, the capitalist order may persist in its reified logic. But it also points to the problem of understanding how, out of the very contradictions of reified experience, practices may emerge that could resolve the crisis in an emancipatory direction. Recent approaches to reification have mostly dealt with the first problem, while skewing the second problem in an attempt to avoid Lukács' account of the proletariat as the identical subject object of history. However, as I intend to show, once the transition from reified to revolutionary consciousness is reconstructed as a series of phenomenological stages not immediately connected to the proletariat as an empirical social class, 
a different conception of the emancipatory process can emerge. One through which, as we shall see, the double concealment or double naturalization of rapeite experience is progressively, though never fully, overcome. So I will distinguish uh, four or five uh, phases or stages. So the first of them consists in what Lukács would calls immediate consciousness. Here, reality presents itself in terms of an opposition between an active subject who attempts to dominate the world by providing it with a rational form in a passive object expected to comply with such a rationalization. The double concealment or naturalization of reification is here in full force, perceiving itself as the subject of a rational process oriented towards the domination of external reality through the discovery of its loss. The individual does not see itself as a material being which is concretely bound to the, its object. The concreteness of the world here remains concealed, unconscious, under the veil of a naturalized, hey, historical, abstract, subject-object relationship. It is as if no material aspect existed that could not be reduced to a rational form by an active uh, subject. So to be sure, for Lukács, this consciousness cannot avoid somehow sensing the limits of its reified experience. These limits are manifested as an occasional external resistance of the object to the rationalizing activity of the subject. That is, in Lukács' words, as an outermost barrier that cannot be crossed. Yet at this stage, those limits are perceived as surpassable, as the sign of an insufficient rationalization that shall hence be driven even further. In the end, reality cannot but present itself here in terms of an external confrontation between a rational formalizing subject and a formalizing and only occasionally organic irrational resistant object. However, consciousness is led to move beyond those limits when that appearance of activity can no longer be sustained. When the external world can not only occasionally resist the individual's efforts at dominating it via calculation, but seems to fight back, and I quote, in every aspect of daily life in which the individual imagines himself to be the subject of his own life, he finds this to be an illusion that is destroyed by the immediacy of his existence. End of quote. At this point, which for Lukács could only be reached by the worker, the individual is compelled to acknowledge that their actions are only moments of a process of abstraction in which he is no more than a cipher reduced to an abstract uh, quantity, a mechanized and rationalized tool. What appeared before as a form giving activity facing occasional but surpassable external limits is now disclosed as mere passivity. Rather than an active subject, the individual now recognizes themselves as the pure and mere object of societal events. The contradictory dynamic between the thrust for rationalization and the concrete resistances to this process now reaches the human being itself. What in the previous stage of consciousness applied only to external objects comes to apply now to the individual themselves as an object of abstraction. The limits of reification no longer arise only in the confrontation with the external world, but now also in relation to one's interiority. The outward barrier has become an inward barrier. That which in the human being cannot be fully rationalized appears at this point as an inner contingent, ungraspable, organic, irrational element. I quote Lukács, human qualities that in the idiosyncrasies appear as mere sources of error. What emerges here, in other words, is an internal conflict between a rational form ascribed to the human being by a process of abstraction and an irrational life manifested as an occasional inner resistance to that process. This form of consciousness is still designated by Lukács as immediate, for here the assumption is retained that one could only consist in either a, an object, a subject or an object of an abstraction. Here, as in the previous form of consciousness, the concreteness of life can only appear as an irrational, ungraspable, indeterminate element that resists rationalization. The situation changes, however, when this concrete inner element is no longer recognized as an incomprehensible resistance to rationalization, but rather as necessarily linked to rationalization, acknowledging themselves both as an object of calculation and as organically resisting to it, the individual may come to fathom the connection between these two dimensions. 
they may perceive in their own life that every quantitative change to which they are submitted corresponds to a qualitative variation which they experience. The material character of the human being no longer appears as an irrational inner limit to the process of rationalization, but is revealed in its qualitative concrete liveliness. I quote Lukacs, the quantitative differences in exploitation which appear to the capitalist in the form of quantitative determinants of the objects of his calculation must appear to the worker as the decisive qualitative categories of his whole physical, mental, and moral existence. So the individual perceives the effects of abstraction in their own physical being. They identify in their own suffering the qualitative marks of a quantitative process beyond their control. The individual thus realizes that they not merely have a body which resists abstraction, but are a living vulnerable body which suffers and experiences abstraction. So the first type of that double naturalization, which I uh, uh, approached before, the concealment of a concrete matter by an abstract form thus comes to be unveiled here. The individual perceives in their own life the subjugation of the concrete to the abstract. They may acknowledge then not only their own dilaceration, but also that of, of, of other living beings insofar as they all partake in concrete life processes and are objectified by the same process of abstraction. This allows in turn the limits to reification to be understood differently. Once suffering is perceived as the effect of an abstraction process unto a vulnerable body, the resistances to this process may appear accordingly as one's own resistances, that is, as the expression of one's body's own living force. One now is able to see oneself as the bearer of a concrete labor power, which not only resists rationalization, but also enables and supports it. The split between the mechanical and the organic is further mediated. Here, reifying abstraction is shown to depend on the very concrete matter it attempts to dominate and conceal. This alters the understanding of, of what power is. Power no longer appears as the activity of a calculating subject, but rather as the manifestation of a living productive force that is shared with other beings which partake in the same concrete life processes. Consciousness then comes to see itself as bound to a collective power that lies beneath those abstract forms and acts as their driving force. And I quote, the, the special uh, in the consciousness and in this consciousness and through it, the special objective character of labor as a commodity, its use value, that is its ability to yield surplus fat produce, now awakens and becomes social reality. At this point, the human being's self-consciousness becomes what Lukacs calls the self-consciousness of the commodity, that is, the self-consciousness of one's own dilacerated condition as both object of a process of abstraction and a concrete productive force which drives and is subjective and is concealed by that process. The second side of that double concealment or naturalization is here unveiled. The split between the abstract and the concrete is disclosed, disclosed as a product of history and therefore as something that can be transformed. In fact, one can now recognize that the reified order is already undergoing change. The perception of oneself as part of a shared life force emerges at the moment in which that force is already being exerted. That is, in which the resistance to reification is being enacted as one's own shared resistance. In other words, uh, at this point, one realizes that one was already throughout the whole process, uh, that the, the whole process was already a practical endeavor. So this collective living forms comes to be recognized as such in the very process of its being collectively self-organized and set against, against existing reified forms, informing new forms. It awakens and becomes social reality in Lukacs' words through an ongoing dynamic by which um, it ceases to be the unannounced Knowledge driving wheel of capitalist reification and becomes the acknowledged driving wheel of a transformative praxis. Racial activity no longer appears as the act of an isolated calculative subject, but is now mediated by a living force that is collective because grounded in a shared condition of vulnerability. So the emergence of revolutionary consciousness is therefore a process whereby the double concealment or naturalization 
constitutive of reification is progressively unraveled. As we saw, this process takes place as a series of unveilings. Behind the apparent activity of a calculating subject, one finds the passivity of a calculated object. Behind the passivity of this abject, abstract object, one finds the vulnerability of a living being. Behind the vulnerability of such a being, one finds a living force, which may then become real activity that is transformative practices to the extent that it finds expression via collective self-organization and struggle in the creation of novel forms. As this recapitulation indicates, the process of dereification should not be conceived as one in which the differences between activity, passivity, vulnerability, and force are dissolved. Rather, it consists in a path through which these differences come to be articulated in a way that they do not conceal each other, but rather translate in, into each other, find expression into, in each other, mediate one another. Activity comes to be mediated by force. Force comes to be mediated by vulnerability. Vulnerability comes to be mediated by passivity. Overcoming reification does not involve the rediscovery of a pre-given unity, but instead an ongoing process of unveiling and articulation. And so this was the first part of the paper. The second part, which I cannot present, would present the social grounds in which I believe this reinterpretation of Lukacs can be founded. And unfortunately, I will, won't be able to mention, but perhaps in the discussion, we can talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's, uh, sorry, the time, time is what it is, marching relentlessly on. Um, Marilla, if you wanna, if you wanna go now, and then we'll be able to have questions afterwards. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, First of all, I'd like just to, to thank everyone, uh, thank, thank uh, Historical Materialist for accepting my proposal. I'm quite, quite glad to, to be here again. And thanks to, to Artur, to Robert, Filippo, to, to, to Paul, to everyone. So uh, this year marks uh, 50 years since Lukas' death. And I'm quite glad that we got like three different moments of Lukas here in the panel today. And uh, thinking about recent discussions on nature and Marxism in the Anthropocene or Capitalocene, I'd like to bring uh, for discussion here today some thoughts about Lukas and nature. And I like to do so uh, thinking uh, about the peculiar place occupied by uh, Lukas in some of the reflections of the Metabolic Rift School. And th this peculiar place is expressed in John Bellamy's foster recent book, The Return of Nature, that, that just won the Deutscher Memorial Prize. And, and in it, Foster talks about the, the tradition of Western Marxism, uh, which was very much influenced by Lukács' history uh, and class consciousness. And uh, Foster talks about this kind of uh, denial of dialectics of nature. And, and, and the place uh, occupied by Lukács in this discussion is peculiar because, as Foster says, uh, Lukács later emerged as the most powerful critic of this interdiction of dialectics of nature in, in Foster's uh, own, own words. But uh, anyway, there, there are major discussions about young Lukács and nature. Uh, I don't want to engage in, in this here today. I'm still trying to make sense. There's a growing literature about it and I'm still trying to engage with, with this. Uh, what I, but I what would like to say about young Lukács is that I think in these debates, uh, sometimes more credit should be given to old Lukács assessment of his own past work especially when, when Lukács says that history and class consciousness takes like a, a strong position against Marxism and uh, ontological foundations. Uh, when, when, he, when he deals with nature, he says that nature is a social category and Marxism uh, 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 um, as a social theory or only a social philosophy. But anyway, so, so far I agree with the excellent paper by Timothy Haug in a recent issue of the French periodical Actuel Marx, uh, where he considers that there is uh, several layers of a constructivist approach to nature in young Lukács and, and that there is this uh, uh, realist perspective in or naturalist perspective in old Lukács ontology. 
But uh, Haug also argues that there is this kind of productivism in the ontology that kind of undermines an ecological approach based in this realist or naturalist perspective. And this is, I think this is interesting, especially considering that Lukács ontology uh, has received little attention here uh, in Europe and particularly in the Anglophone world. But this also seems to be changing thanks also to, to the work of the Metabolic Rift uh, School. Uh, but what doesn't appear in either Haug critique of the metabolic rift school reading of, of old Lukash, and what doesn't appear also uh, in 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 the in the metabolic rift or in a Haug uh, paper, is uh, the peculiar reading of Marx's labor theory of value. And I tried to develop this in my PhD thesis, including some reflections about the consequences to to nature. And, but about nature, this is, is still a work in progress. And my assessment to Lukács' interpretation of the labor theory of value is based in a, in a brief critique that uh, Peter Hood is made to Lukács' reading of the theory of value. But it is mainly influenced by Istvan Mezado's sharp critique of Lukács' uh, work. Mezado's uh, perspective has received more attention uh, lately, uh, thanks, uh, thanks to, to, to the work of the Metabolic Rift School. Uh, and we're quite happy that uh, Mesado's archive uh, is here at the University of Campinas in Brazil, uh, thanks to the efforts of Professor Ricardo Antunes, who very often attends to historical materialism. And Ricardo books, by the way, uh, Farewell to Work, uh, question mark, uh, which is a, a sociological uh, uh, classic uh, uh, on labor here uh, in Brazil, written pretty much in this Lukashian Mesados tradition. Uh, it, it will be published in English uh, tomorrow, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, uh, metabolism and productivism in Lukash ontology. There's a lot to talk about, but I'll try to, to, to keep it brief. The way I understand Lukács' ontology, uh, uh, its departure, its starting point, it's uh, an assertion about objectivity. So Lukács doesn't start with consciousness, he doesn't start with epistemology or with gnosiology or with the commodity, he doesn't start even with labor, but with objectivity. And he based his argument in Marx's economic and philosophical manuscripts, and uh, in there, he kind of searches for a kind of a interrelation between objectivities. And this interrelation between objectivities, Lukács argues, is always dynamic, is always complex, and uh, there is the possibility of emergency of new beings. So Lukács recognizes his own limited knowledge in natural science, uh, but he puts forward uh, this kind of imminent development of being with continuities and discontinuities and qualitative leaps. And from this emerges three different dimensions of being that are inextricably linked to each other, the inorganic being, the organic being, and the social being. So he says biological re re reproduction emerges from these complex interactions inside the inorganic being and uh, biological reproduction depends both internally and externally of these interactions with uh, inorganic being. And uh, this objective movement in nature uh, follows uh, contingent and causal connections. But Lukács describes this, it's his own words, uh, describes as a principle of motion on its own basis. And Though this might seem trivial, uh, it is important. I think it, it becomes important nowadays because Lukács, he, he steps forward and he tries to describe what nature is without reducing nature to a kind of a linguistic construction as postmodern perspectives uh, often do. And he recognized that there are several different representations of the world and of nature and he recognized limitations of, of these representations as well, including the limitations of his own rep representation of nature. Nevertheless, he still thinks it's possible and necessary to address uh, uh, this objectivity of uh, nature and of the world uh, ontologically. And to refine this ontology of nature, uh, Lucas sees uh, as crucial a critical dialogue with natural sciences. 
which I think it becomes important nowadays as well, considering the extreme uh, skeptic approach of natural science by, by social science. On the other hand, there, there is this uh, uh, idea of an immanent objective development of nature of, again, in Lucas Schwartz, of this principle of motion on its own basis. And I think this becomes important considering the, the perspectives of new materialism or actor the network theory that ascribes agency to objects. And I think as Alf Hornborg uh, argued, uh, uh, I think pretty, pretty well, he says that objects have consequences, but not agency. And this ascri uh, ascription of agency to objects results in fetishism. So when Lucas argues about objectivity and the principle of motion on its own basis, he stresses the importance of the mat materiality of nature without incurring in fetishism. Agency in the ontology is an attribute of the social being and appears already in the particular, uh, uh, well, there's in, in an embryonic form also in, in the organic being, but is an attribute mainly of the, of the, of the social being. And, and agency appears in this particular type of metabolism established between humans and nature through labor. So here he argues that teleological acts meet the causality of the external world and the materi materiality of this external world is such that the worker has to submit itself to this materiality in order to see a goal previously uh, in his head actually objectified in, in, in reality. So uh, no matter how, but Lukács argues that no matter how deep this intervention of labor and materiality is, for Lukács, the unity between teleology and non-human nature is never an identity. So non-human nature uh, and the artifacts created by labor are always under this principle of motion on its own base. So in, in Lukács' ontological framework, there's never a complete domination of nature or a production of nature which is to say that there's never a complete subsumption of nature by the social. And more importantly, there, uh, the kind of intervention of labor in the complexity of nature is always limited in the sense of knowing pre previously the consequences of this intervention. So this is the problem of unintended consequences, but unintended consequences that are triggered by human agency, by human teleological acts. And as Andreas Mom and others have argued, uh, I think this, this is important because there is a link between responsibility and agency, or a link between teleological acts and either intended or unintended consequence. So just to, to sum up uh, very briefly, uh, this realist perspective about nature is important considering the great ecological impact humans under capitalism have on nature. And so the ontological framework of Lukács is important because it doesn't reduce nature to epistemology or gnosiology you know, you know, or to a linguistic construction. Uh, it doesn't uh, assume an extreme skepticism about natural science. And it doesn't assume a perspective of production of nature or complete domination of nature by capital or a subsumption of nature by the social. Uh, so uh, Lukács thinks about the agents above all, considering this human teleological act and its intended and necessary, uh, necessarily unintended consequence. And also, of course, it, it is important because Lukács thinks uh, uh, all of this, uh, considering the emergency of social classes. And it, it's, it is also important because the ontology, Lucas ontology, has uh, as its normative goal the idea of a, a kind of a humanity for itself, of individualities that can recognize themselves as belonging to this humanity, and all this based in this relationship with nature. But from the environmental point of view, this realist perspective about nature, which could be fruitful, which could be good, is undermined by the way Lukács thinks, uh, uh, thinks the relationship between labor and the particular, particular forms of social production. And this is, is expressed in Lukács' peculiar generalization of Marx's labor theory of value. 
Lucas talks about the, the, the law of value. He says that it's implicitly present in societies before commodity production emerges. And he says it's present also after commodity exchange ceases to, to exist. And Lucas says in communism, that, that's, he, he's saying that communism, in communism, the law of value continues to regulate production. And there is a, a certain coherence, let's say, let's put it this way, a, a coherence in this odd generalization in Lucas ontology. Because with the generalization of, uh, of the law of value, main aspects of uh, capitalist production are generalized uh, as well to different, uh, uh, to different historical periods. So uh, the opacity of economic valuations are generalized, indirect social labor, uh, is generalized as well. Socially necessary labor time is generalized and this compulsory tendency to reduce labor, labor time, all, all these are generalized in the ontology. So uh, the different uh, the different teleological acts of individuals in production, Lucas says, they are synthesized in this law uh, that exists in every economy and that points to this reduction of labor time. And Lucas says this law is in, independent of what individuals think about it, think of it, uh, and the and the individuals have to adapt to this law or perish in Lucas' uh, own words. Uh, Mesados, Ishiba Mesados, criticized heavily this a historical approach taken uh, by Lucas in the ontology. But anyway, it is in his, uh, let's say his last work, it is this kind of, this law that kind of uh, animates the movement of the social being in its different historical phases again. So there's no time to, to, to go through the question of alienation here, but uh, I'll just say that Lucas sees that this, mo this movement in production um, under this law that he generalized, he sees that this oppress individuals. Nevertheless, Lucas ascribes an optimistic end in this oppression. Individuals under this economic law, they can suffer today, but tomorrow humankind as a whole will benefit and individuality itself will be enriched. So uh, this ahistorical law and, his, and, and this optimism is always articulated with Lucas' uh, realist conception of nature. And this is most problematic when, when Lukács is discussing Marx's idea of freedom in the realm of necessity in an emancipated society. Marx talks about the rational regulation of the metabolism with nature. And the metabolic rift school show pretty well that the, there, there's this ecological dimension in this. But Lukács reads Marx through, uh, Lukács reads Marx's idea of re, uh, rational regulation of the metabolism with nature through this generalization of the law of value and through this compulsory tendency to reduce labor time. Furthermore, Lukács says that uh, labor and science, and science can only intensify the metabolism with nature. And uh, although he understands this, he's stressing that nature can never be fully subsumed by the social. Lukács doesn't see that this uh, metabolism under the law of value can lead to not can lead not to an intensification of the metabolism with nature, but to a irreparable rift. So while there is what seems a fruitful realist perspective of uh, of nature in Lukács ontology, this fruitful aspect seems to be undermined by Lukács productivist optimism, but this is all translated in a very peculiar reading of Marx's labor theory of law. So that's it, guys. Thank you. You finished more than on time there after, after the worries. You could have almost done a few minutes. Um, okay, so I think it's important if people do want to ask questions, um, put some questions in the chat. We've already, we've already seen a few. Um, I think I'll I'll start off maybe by just uh, throwing just a couple of questions myself as well as the questions from um, from the audience. So I think one thing that I wanted to ask Filippo and to a degree Artur um, is 
in the kind of discussion and, and typology of the work you've been discussing, where do you think Lukács' little book on Lenin fits into the kind of like narrative that you've uh, been saying? Because it's kind of a peculiarly situated book in the context of like his political evolution and in some ways represents like slight breaks from history and class consciousness, but in other ways you, you can't necessarily assimilate to like a Stalinist. And so I'm just interested in seeing where you thought that that fit. So I'd love you to go through a little bit more about in, in a related way to that, how you think that that, um, that fits with the kind of collective self-expression stuff that you were kind of hinting at in the second part of the paper and how that relates back to um, reification and, you know, so, and then reflecting also on what Lukács makes of, of, of pies as political organisations and how you think that fits in with, with that. Merlo, I, just, I kind of wanted to clarify a little bit, and this is also because I just don't know um, the ontology stuff well enough like how do you think that Lukas would respond in the if you could summon him from beyond the grave um what do you think the response to something like Jason Moore's position would be which is not necessarily that like nature is subsumed into production but that production by definition takes place within nature and therefore like any kind of separation in that sense misses out on the, the embeddedness or the situatedness of like productive activity in ecologies broadly considered like I was just wondering how you think that, like what the kind of Lukacian response to that might be and, and and how that kind of area might be demarcated um we've also got one uh one question so far from the audience and I'll just add that into you guys into the mix for you guys as well because I think that will just help you think and, and that's from Mike V who says can critical theory explain the necessity for emancipating population, proclamation, organization of labor and civil rights for African-Americans? So we might, and so I think that's a very important question to gloss on it. We might say like, well, how does the kind of stuff that Lukács is talking about in these, in, in these contexts explain and relate to forms of racialized difference and other differences and, and what can like Lukács say or explain about that kind of thing? Um, so it, whoever wants to volunteer to start, just uh, unmute and start talking. Or I'll just, I'll call someone's name out in a second if no one, I feel like I'm in a class, like, unmute, please. Okay, okay, I'll start then. <laughs> As in a class. Um, uh, okay, so I'll start by, by, by the second part uh, of your question, Robert. Um, thank you, thank you for your question, and also thank you, Mike, for 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 your question. Um, so the part that I didn't, because my problem in this presentation is that I was trying to say how a reconstruction of Lukacs could bring theory and practice together and and not build a gap, and I only talked about theory. So the second part is quite important, but I'll just briefly mention that I. I tried to formulate an analysis uh, which identifies the, the, the central figure of the self-entrepreneur, the precarized self-entrepreneur as an outcome of a simultaneous process of bourgeoisification and proletarianization. And briefly, this means bourgeois, bourgeoisification in the sense that more and more individuals, classes, groups uh, see themselves as uh, entrepreneurs. So in the sense, uh, uh, see themselves as bourgeois entrepreneurs, uh, but also more and more uh, groups and individuals uh, are subjected to, uh, a pro uh, to, to, a, to a super exploitation whereby they're in the situation that Marx said, well, they're both free to sell their labor and they're free because they're, they only have their label to sell. In this case, they're, they're free to invest their human capital, uh, but they're also free because the only thing that they have to offer is their human capital. Um, so this creates a situation where there is both an intensification of the blockages to, to emancipatory struggles, but also an intensification, aggravation of the tensions that, uh, according to Lukács, uh, move uh, struggle forward. And I cannot say more than that. Um, one of the expressions of this is the figure of the one, the of the self-exploited. So the self-entrepreneur is also self-exploited. In, in any case, um, this, this is sort of, so it leads to a situation where there's an aggravation of subjective tensions within capitalism and, and also 
in a sense, uh, the possibility, the potential for emancipation is everywhere and nowhere. Uh, because there is no specific social group that can embody it, but at the same time is disseminated throughout more and more uh, layers of, of society. So, okay, so moving then to the second part. So what does it tell us about political organization, Lenin, or in Lukács' case, Lenin or Rosa Luxemburg. And this is a part of the paper that I intend to develop in other works, because I think precisely the question is uh, how, the question for both is how to transform this living productive collective force into a form. And I think Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg give very different answers to this. Uh, I cannot go more into this because I don't have, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's not articulated enough, but I think for the present, that's a crucial question. And I think in the past years, we saw, we saw uh, a, a trend, a wave of movements in a sort of Luxembourgian moment of spontaneity, uh, anarchism, I think Occupy Wall Street in very large, of course, general terms, the June, uh, the June 2013 in Brazil and other places. And at least in Brazil, that went very wrong. That went very, very badly. I mean, it had very bad outcomes. So we need a bit of more learning, I would say, but without looting, losing the Luxembourgian moment, which I think is very appropriate to this conjunction of bourgeoisification and proletarianization where emancipatory potentials are everywhere and not in a single group. Okay, thank you all. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, if Murillo is okay for you, if I go next, or <laughs> okay, thanks. So um, thank you uh, for your questions, Robert and uh, Mike from the uh, chat. <laughs> and so, um, well, these are both really fascinating and uh, important questions, so I'll do my best. <laughs> I, I know it will not be exhaustive, but um, so in response to your question, Robert, I think Lukács is a fascinating thinker because uh, he constantly revised uh, his positions and uh, his self-criticism sometimes was so harsh <laughs> throughout his, his life. And <laughs> In my view, this is why Lukács is so fascinating today, be probably because of his incoherence also. <laughs> and um, so the kind of um, part or phase in Lukács' life that I kind of um, I'm working with at the moment is interesting because it's one of the most dramatic, probably, and problematic. So um, my response, I don't know if it's really answering your question, so feel free to <laughs> ask again if you like to, but um, is that we should not take Lukács as a blueprint, also because that would mean to reify his thought in many ways, but actually to find all the undercurrents and the open questions at work, uh, you know, in his in his throughout his work um, as open open problems for all of us, um, and so um, uh, I will. I think like this, this is this will be my answer. I don't know if it's a good answer to your question, but so I will position him as a very, very uh, incoherent and controversial thinker. And because of that, a very interesting and timely one. And I want to also to relate this to the second question um, about uh, the relevance of uh, Lukacs or um, critical theory to the organization of labor and civil rights for African Americans. Now, um, I think this is a really fascinating point because, um, first of all, I see now there is an emerging debate around Afro-pessimism and uh, questions about uh, social death and um, identities <laughs> being produced as uh, key terms in this debate. Um, and also, there is what I'm, I mean, from what I've, I've been following in the past few years, um, a kind of intergenerational debate. I remember a really intense debate between Cornel West and Tani Hizzi Coates a few years ago, in which uh, Cornel West uh, attacked basically younger <laughs> activists from younger generations for, well, we could say, you know, with Lukacs probably, and I, I don't know what the other speakers would think about this, but 
um, for reifying probably the heritage of civil rights movements and the struggle for uh, you know equality, racial equality. So actually, uh, my view is that a thinker like Lukacs could be immensely productive today, especially in this context, because we can have uh, you know Raymond Williams used this beautiful expression, the resources of hope, <laughs> uh, in his work for probably well also engaging with Afro pessimism and all the problems that uh, all these uh, you know entanglements of struggles for equality in capitalism and actually in the reproduction of uh, economic structures of exploitation you know are kind of uh, showing us at the moment. So again, I don't know if this answers the question, but uh, thank you for for asking you know these really interesting uh, points. No, I think that did answer the question, and I'll just uh, say that actually uh, one thing to really back you up, Filippo, is that there has been a wave of work trying to think about racist relationship to reification as a way for Marxists to think through the specificity of race as a category. And in fact, when HM's race and capital issue comes out, uh, we will have some stuff on that too. Um, Marilla, do you want to go now? And then we'll... I'll yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the for the question, Robert, and thanks for the question also, Mike. Uh, yeah, the thing of Lukas uh, coming out of the grave and trying to figure out w what the twenty first century is. Actually, there there is this kind of uh, famous interview uh, Lukas gave for a, an Australian uh, uh, a, a journalist or a member of the Communist Party. I can Bernie Taft was his name. And then Lukas looks, uh, he paints a really uh, dark um, scenery of uh, 68 uh, and of uh, Soviet Union as well. But then he sees, the, the, the Bernie Taft tells him, uh, look, you, you, you seem really pessimistic. And then Lukas responds, no, actually, I'm optimistic for the 21st century. So <laughs> it is funny because we are here in the 21st century and we don't have any reasons to be uh, very optimistic. And uh, I think uh, Lukas uh, uh, didn't see, of course, the, the ecological crisis of, of today, but this kind of material ma materialism that he, he puts forward, I, I think it helps us to think. And there's actually, Ichiba Mesarus is uh, considered like his critical hair. And uh, Mesarus actually worked on, in this uh, and criticized heavily his old, his old teacher. And uh, Mesarus paints this, uh, this very early, this uh, dark scenery as well for the 21st century, said that there's no hope. We, we, we can, uh, of course, there's hope, but if we carry on in this, in this course, we're going to basically explode the planet. And then Mesarus, uh, from the theoretical point of view, I think he, um, he works more directly in this uh, in the social forms in which labor could be realized. So there's uh, there's not much hope uh, in the development of the productive uh, of the productive forces by its, itself. Actually, the, this under capitalism is leading uh, us to to disaster as the as the 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 metabolic rift to school uh, says. So. I uh, says and and kind of uh, in this kind of inheritance of of what Mesarus said as well. So I think to address Jason Moore, I'm still trying to 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 figure out uh, Jason Moore. I know uh, there's uh, uh, there's this uh, uh, heavy and very heated debate uh, between Moore uh, uh, and the world ecology and the metabolic rift. But uh, I think the question of limits of this development of capital is uh, it's uh, it's important, and the way we address natural science it is important as well. Well, we've seen the IPCC reports, uh, and they are quite urgent. And I think we should address this more more seriously. I'm, I'm not saying that more doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't do that, but uh, in some ways I think. There's some space there to kind of neglect neglect this uh, this uh, these limits and to say there is uh, this uh, singular metabolism. I, I think sometimes is quite dangerous and think about uh, about a positive uh, a positive side for the collapse of of capital. 
for us here in Brazil, this is this is uh, sorry to say that it's it's really it's really heavy to 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 say okay, there's a, a positive side for this collapse of of capitalism because of, you know because of a singular metabolism. I'm not I, I I'm pretty sure I'm not being very fair to to Moore, but uh, I'll leave it with that. And this kind of uh, uh, the the idea of the the development of productive force that is in Lukács uh, ontology. I think there's uh, a lot to be criticized uh, there as well for, from the point of view of the, uh, of the racial question as, um, as Mike put, put forward, because this kind of progress kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, really had a huge impact and it was really close to ideological ideas of of, of race and uh, kind of proliferated this uh, uh, this uh, racism. And Lukas actually fought against the uh, against this. He wrote some some interesting uh, thoughts on on racism in the destructive destruction of reason. And also some comments uh, about everyday life, uh, which was put forward uh, by Agnes Heller as well. So there is some 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 theoretical elements there that could be mobilized to think uh, uh, to think on, on race and capitalism today. But this is, I think, it's uh, most of all our task in the 21st century. So that's it. Great, thank you. So we got another question in the chat, I think one of which can be addressed more broadly and one of which I think is specifically for Artur, uh, so I think everyone's seen it, but so this is from Yagmo Ali Koskin. And so the first question is, where would Lukash's debate with Brett and everyone else on aesthetics fit in some of these stories and these topologies? And I think it'd be interesting for people to say that in general. And then I think the one more directed towards um, Artur would be, can you expand a little bit on the simultaneous bourgeoisification and proletarianization? Is that to do with like Uber or whatever? And if so, is that not a kind of legal fiction or reification? So I don't know, who, again, who wants to go first? We can just go in the same order that you did it last time. That's the easiest way to do it. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, so thank you, Yagmur, for the, for the question. Thank you, Robert. Um, uh, so I'll, I think I only really have to, uh, something to say about the, the 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 second question. So, yes, what I do have in mind is is Uber, but not, not only. So, uh, but Uber is a is a central um, example example. Um, but um, so, isn't that kind of a legal fiction reification? Yes, yes, and that's if I understood what you mean by legal fiction. But but I think. That's um, so. The, the, so they did, so that's part of the bourgeoisification process. Where uh, because for Lukacs, uh, okay. So the idea behind of this diagnosis of simultaneous uh, proletarization and bourgeoisification are some limits of what I find uh, limit some limitations that I find in Lukacs's uh, sociological account of of classes and capitalism in history and class consciousness, whereby he he sees the bourgeoisie as uh, sticking to its status of apparent subject because they can, and the proletariat as driven to social transformation uh, because they cannot. They cannot sustain that illusion that they are subjects. And I think uh, that showed itself in history to be quite simplistic. And, and so I try to reformulate the question, trying uh, to see two, two, two sides of both bourgeoisification and proletarization. So on the one hand, um, this the fact that everyone sees uh, itself or almost everyone as entrepreneurial, self-entrepreneurs, uh, but also submitted to this proletarianization, precarization process, uh, it, on the one hand, it, it intensifies the blockages to, to struggles against reification because on the one hand, everyone is uh, can be more afraid to lose their status as subjects, even if apparent ones. But and and also, uh, since everyone is proletarian, as I, okay, precarized, uh, we have more and more to lose. Uh, 
I mean, th so that's that's a factor. This second factor, I think, it's not accounted for in Lukacs's view. Uh, that's a blockage to to revolutionary emancipatory transformation when you have too much to lose. So it's better just to stick with what you have. Um, but also, I think this not only uh, helps to capitalism to reproduce itself, but also it intensifies, aggravates its contradictions. Because uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, agreeing with Lukacs, since more and more people are in a pro proletarian situation, the drive, the motor for for revolutionary struggle is there. This negative force that uh, that since we see we we feel even even though we do not see ourselves but we feel ourselves as just ob objects submitted to a uh, rationalization process so there is this drive to transforming this um, and at the same time since uh, everyone or almost everyone is bourgeois if <laughs> can see it oneself as a self entrepreneur yeah i give myself a problem with this uh, <laughs> uh, see can see oneself as a self entrepreneur there are also these expectations to really become a sub an actual subject so these are driving forces for emancipatory struggles and so what can i say at the moment is that really just a, an aggravation of the subjective tensions, which is, I think, again, is well captured, but that by that figure where of the of being one's own boss, where one exploits itself. Um, yeah, I think that's it. And I think that I mean, it's important. The Uber example is just good uh, to see how that applies, because many times uh, I think Zizek also uh, Byung Chul Han have discussed this figure of the self exploited individual as maybe specific to certain classes. And I think uh, when one look, uh, at least when, when I see the works on, on, on Uberization in Brazil, we would just see that it's just really, really disseminated. Okay, thank you. Filippo, do you want to respond on the blog way, maybe? Uh, yes, of course. Um, uh, thank you, Yegmu, for the question. Um, well, um, I have to say, one way probably of addressing this <laughs> would be to uh, note how uh, in literary criticism today, in particular in you know, post-colonial and world literary studies, uh, the question of realism has re-emerged today as a pressing central issue. Uh, in particular, here I'm thinking of the work of uh, critics like Joe Cleary or the Warwick Research Collective and how uh, a Marxist kind of approach to literature today, even considering uh, the global unevenness of this, um, has uh, kind of uh, seems to resonate uh, with the, you know, the work of Lukacs. And actually, I don't know if I can turn this also into a question for the other speakers in many ways. Uh, as I know, uh, these critics are drawing also on the work of uh, a Brazilian critic called Roberto Schwartz. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on this, uh, if um, in your view, Roberto Schwartz's uh, work on literature and peripherality might in any way resonate with Lukacs or even in a critical way you know, kind of be positioned in the, in the tradition of thinking about realist uh, literature uh, and Marxist criticism opened by Lukacs in many ways. So I hope this is a good transition from, uh, from an answer to a question. <laughs> Great. Um, and that this means that, Marilla, I'm going to, because there's also been an, another two questions specifically for you, so we may as well roll everything together so you can... <laughs> You can remark about Schwartz, um, and then I think these two questions from Laura Lady are very interesting. So how would you describe the process of, of Lukács bringing natural dialectics to the centre of his reflections? What triggered it? What caused it? Um, and then second thing, do you think Mazaris' work specifically is influenced by Bloch and his considerations on nature and natural subjectivity? So you've got, you've got a bunch of stuff to say now. <laughs> 
Okay, th th thank you, Laura. Laura, uh, I must say, uh, she's she she's a Brazilian as well. A lot of uh, a lot of Brazilians around Lucas, uh, and thanks to the work of Roberto Schwartz and José Paulo Neto, Ricardo Antunes, and a lot of other Brazilians. Um, well, uh, uh, Laura is working as well in in Marx and and, and nature, and, and she has a lot to say. Probably she will fight me on the Jason Moore question, but anyway, we'll leave that for for later. But thank you very much. These are wonderful uh, questions. Uh, the problem, uh, the process of bringing nature dialects to the center of, of this reflection. I, I think this has to do with uh, text and, of course, text and, and context. And uh, and I think uh, the criticism of Deborin and Huda kind of uh, moved Lukash uh, uh, moved Lukash a little bit to to respond to that and to actually refine uh, his uh, his thought in in history in in class consciousness. And uh, of course, he did he did this in his own critical uh, in his own critical way, and I think in a much better. Uh, way than uh, Huda and and and, and Deborin. but uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, as well that uh, his move to to the natural dialectics has uh, something to do with what Filippo uh, mentioned with the uh, reconciliation, or as he says, first first on. I think Lukas uh, saw that uh, well. The, the problem we are we are facing is not a, a, only a problem of the consciousness uh, of the revolutionary consciousness. Revolution, unfortunately, it didn't work, and we stuck here with uh, with uh, the Soviet Union. And Lukas, unfortunately, Lukas says this. Uh, I took I took the position of, of Stalin in the battle in the in the end of the uh, of the 1920s and uh, of socialism in one country. So I think this realist perspective of Lukács has to do with the building of, of, uh, of uh, socialism in one country and bears the consequences of this. I think it, 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 it does. Perhaps Filippo has, uh, has something more to say uh, on, on, on this, but there is this uh, uh, fruitful dimension in, in this realist perspective, but that ends up uh, sometimes opening some uh, avenues to a real, a real politic as well. But what also there is also this text, uh, this text uh, uh, dimension that it's Lukas uh, in nineteen in the early nineteen thirties he discovered the economic and manuscript philosophics. He worked with uh, he worked. Uh, on the on, on on the discovery of the manuscript economic the economic and philosophical manuscripts, and there he sees this kind of uh, uh, objectivity that are more prominent in 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 the manuscripts. Uh, so I think he he th th that's what kind of of triggered, and he tried to in his own way. Uh, try to put forward a critical approach to Stalinism. But uh, at the same time, kind of, uh, kind of internalizing the limits of uh, socialism in one country, and that when Mesaros comes up, comes about, and he sees uh, really early, and that uh, uh, this uh, ontological framework is really interesting. But uh, this, the social forms of production needs to be dealt in, in more in detail, and the consequences of, of this to nature as well needs to be. Uh, worked uh, in a in a in a in a more detailed way. So I I don't think Ernest Bloch uh, cons uh, consideration on natural subjectivity uh, influences Mesaros. I think uh, old Lukas influenced Mesaros uh, in this ontological framework, in this idea of, of objectivity and the impact uh, uh, on nature. Bloch, uh, I think uh, the idea of of hope in Bloch kind of influenced Mesaros and. Uh, Beyond Leviathan will be published, uh, I think, in English in February next year. Here in Brazil, is already uh, was already published uh, by by Boi Tempo uh, Editorial, and uh, there's there there's there I couldn't read yet, but there's there some comments on on blog. But I think the ontological framework uh, Mesaros inherits uh, from 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 Lukash. Uh, that's it. Uh, great, I do. I think we 
any more questions? In Sorry, so just, just Roberto Schwartz, I, I'll leave it with, with Artur. <laughs> I I you, anybody, <laughs> maybe anybody. we can talk about, about later because this is really heavy, heavy stuff. <laughs> I told you what I said about Roberto Schwartz. <laughs> no, yeah. You, 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 okay, that's, that's fair. You take Mitzados, I'll take Schwartz. That's a fair distribution. Um, okay. So what I can what I can say about Schwartz, uh, and, and thank you for the reference actually, because it kind of triggered something that I think it was on the back of my mind. Uh, so so Schwartz, I mean, the, what I really like Schwartz, and I, and I need to mention another Brazilian scholar, Mariana Teixeira, who has done work on Schwartz, has done work on Karl Lukacs and feminism. So I'm very influenced by her work at this point. So. Um, so an essay which I really like from Schwartz is the essay on misplaced ideas, which is the introduction to one of his works on Machado de Assis. And so I'm not going to comment on literary, more literary stuff, but the, the basic idea of this essay is that, okay, you take Brazilian society in the 19th century, which is when Machado, the society that Machado de Assis is describing. This is a society based on slave labor. And yet you have a lot of liberals in this society. So how can you have liberals defending liberalism and the ideas or the ideas of individual freedom in a society based on slavery? Uh, so, so his answer is, uh, yeah, so, so, so liberalism is a misplaced idea, it's an idea that which is not in place there. But he doesn't stop there because Schwartz is a dialectician. So he's saying, no, precisely this, is illuminating about liberalism. The, so, so the fact that it's out of, out of place, that it's misplaced, uh, means that it is in place. So, so it reveals a truth about liberalism that perhaps in Europe at the time, it, it wasn't so, so clear. So this is the basic idea. And I think it's very, it resonates well, now that you asked, I think it resonates really well with the, the idea of a standpoint of the proletariat or a, a peripheral standpoint, we could say not in geopolitical terms, but in class terms or any other terms, uh, which is the idea, yeah, that precisely uh, these positions, these more marginalized positions can be uh, il illuminating about the center because, it, because there the contradictions are more exposed, so to speak. Um, and then, I mean, this also triggered a, a lot about, because I'm, in my paper, I exactly uh, was saying that this is not so simple in the contemporary uh, moment, and perhaps also in geopolitical terms, it's not that simple. So also maybe the periphery, it's more and more everywhere, and we can perhaps think of the, the importance given to the issue of migration, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, I think we've had a good discussion. I just wanted to see if anyone on the panel wanted to say any uh, final words, not that you're going to die, but just to say any, any kind of closing final words. Um, anyone want to say anything? Uh, just, just to thank you, Robert, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Filippo. Thank you, Murilo. I mean, it was a great session. Really enjoyed. And yeah, I think the papers yeah, really matched. Yeah. I've learned a lot. So I think it's been really good. I also wanted to thank you all for your uh, wonderful papers and um, questions. And actually, uh, this is so fascinating, by the way, also your uh, answer to the Schwartz, <laughs> sorry to say this, <laughs> but so many, uh, so many interesting uh, terms for discussion. Because, sorry, just if I could say just a very quick point here, uh, is that, um, you know, one of the problems about problems or questions about Lukács is how he was still attached to a tradition of European uh, culture and writing. And yet, <laughs> it seems that some of the questions he was able to ask are so relevant today to, you know, I work in world literature, so to many uh, contexts that go beyond Europe, or in which we can see like uh, peripheral, uh, you know, processes of uh, combined and uneven development at work. So uh, I think this is an immensely productive conversation to, to continue, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just would like to say thank you as well to everyone, to Robert, Paul, uh, Filippo, Artur, to Laura, to Mike, to, to everyone. It was really great. Hope we can continue this, this discussions, uh, including Roberto Schwartz and, and literature as well. <laughs> uh, I learned a lot. Thank, thank you very much.
Great. Thanks so much for everyone's contributions. It's been really interesting. I agree with everyone. It's been a great conversation and I hope everyone can continue it. Like very good to, to hear Lukács like brought into the present and not just endless discussions over like particularly boring parts of history and class consciousness or whatever. So I really like that was really good. Um, thanks to our audience for asking questions and sticking with us. And thanks again to the speakers. I think we'll bring the session to a, a close now and uh, um, hopefully we'll see people soon and in person maybe at some point. <laughs>